I'll be discussing two of Robert Browning's poems, Porphyria's Lover and My Last Duchess. Um, from a feminist perspective, I'll be talking about the Victorian ideals of the time uh, and some analysis on um, some of the text. So Porphyria's Lover and My Last Duchess were published in 1842 in um, Robert Browning's collection, Dramatic Lyrics from his series of books, Bells and Pomegranates. So the dramatic monologues, they were originally titled Porphyria in Italy, but were renamed to create a stronger association with the theme of gender relations of the Victorian era, in my opinion. So the ideal woman of the time was compliant or else deemed an unsuitable partner. Men of the time demanded both obedience and sentiments from women, and women were expected to be submissive to their partners and agree with their beliefs. So partnered men and women were considered as one unit, the man, basically. Um, so men were concerned with the presentation and attitude of their partners. The subject of the poems invites a feminist reading concerned with how the writing depicts the oppression of women, their prescribed role in relation to men, um, and the consequence of deviating from expectation. So the ideology of the Victorian era um, accepted stark contrasts between identities such as that um, true womanhood wasn't the inherent opposite of a normative manliness, right? So women were expected to be passive and compliant because any different demeanor contradicted the respectable femininity that men ordered from a partner. So cultural expectations of women were, and um, inequalities in relationships are highlighted in the poems that I'll be discussing, clearly through the subject and suggested through particular diction and structure of the writing. So overall, um, Really, uh, Browning writes Porphyria's Lover and My Last Duchess as commentary on the status of the feminist um, Victorian woman and the controlling Victorian man. And a feminist interpretation of the poem highlights the social inequality of the sexes and the consequence of defying uh, Victorian ideas uh, presented in the writing concerns the struggle for gender equality of the era. So this is the entirety of Porphyria's Lover, the poem. So nearly 30 years after its original publication, Porphyria was renamed Porphyria's Lover, giving the title a whole new meaning, right? So this new title refers to the man instead of the woman, but still, you know, the man remains unnamed and is only acknowledged through his relationship with Porphyria. And a man, especially a man of the Victorian era, would not appreciate being unrecognized outside of the context of his relation to his partner as an implied object to a greater subject as the title and the poem suggest, right? So, however, um, this dynamic may occur if a woman is of a higher class. Um, the poem says she is um, one of pride and vainer ties, right? So she is of a higher class. And apart from this, Porphyria independently arrives at the speaker's dwelling amid a storm, which is uncouth for a Victorian woman, you know, to, to wander alone at night without a partner. Yet Porphyria defies her expectations and continues to resist her prescribed position as a woman. She proceeds to be the agent of the poem, right? She starts a fire, she kneels, she rises, she sits by the speaker, she, um, you know, she pulls him around her waist. She is independent and in control and superior and not the ideal Victorian woman. Before she is killed by the speaker, right? Um, she rests the speaker's head on her shoulder. And this, this physical position, right, requires a speaker to look up at her from his lower and subordinate position, which is perceived as the breaking point in the speaker's tolerant, tolerance of inferiority. So within only a moment, the rules are reversed, right? Porphyria is dead, and the speaker says that this time my shoulder bore her head, suggesting that the woman is now below the man. So the speaker, speaker is very anxious. He faces a sense of inferiority, fear of abandonment, and lack of control over Porphyria, and that undermine his role as a traditional Victorian man. The enjambment of the poem's lines and the polysyndeton of the conjunction and connect each line to the next in an overwhelming and continuous list. Um, it's very, there's a lot of anxiety, right? By killing Porphyria, the speaker eliminates possible abandonment while placing her physically inferior to him and controlling her motions. Porphyria's death is only one, but it stands for the quote unquote death of all women who seek autonomy as she does. What continues to live is a condemning of Victorian feminist women who challenge their oppressed status in relation to men. The poem ends by announcing that God has not said a word regarding Porphyria's murder, as if to say that quelling the feminist fight for equality has been approved. Right, so this is My Last Duchess, the whole poem, which was originally published as Italy in reference to the Duke of Ferrara. And um, the title was changed to My Last Duchess, 
to better represent the relationship between the Duke and the Duchess as depicted through the writing. So the present title suggests the possession and the disposable attitude towards the Duchess through the deliberate phrase, my last. All right. So according to the speaker, the Duchess lived indifferently to the Duke's concern, dismissing his authority over her. She was content around others. She's smiling, right, which emasculated the Duke through fear of her infidelity and angered him through her disobedience. And the Duke anxiously imagined why the Duchess smiled for Fra Pandolf, which is the, the artist, um, referring to her smile as a spot of joy, as if this happiness is a blemish or a flaw that, that shouldn't be present, right? The constant smile angers the Duke, only reminding him of his lack of control over her feelings and actions. As much as she angered him, he does not tell her, but instead asks, who would stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Implying that she should already understand how he wants her to behave, right? The Duke is convinced that as a man, he should not have to make an effort to tell the Duchess about the self-doubt that she unintentionally inflicts upon him. And this explanation, according to him, is unnecessary and beneath him and would defy the Victorian social expectations of women's steadfast dedication to men. The Duke says, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. A confession of a crime of murder, right? For a listener, but simply an explanation uh, for the Duke. Since the Duke could not control the Duchess when alive, he would have to have her killed and control her when dead. And all that remains is a painting of the smiling Duchess, the exposure of her smile depending on the Duke, right? Because he controls the curtain that covers the painting. And the self-ruling wife was the fear of Victorian men. And the painting represents the ownership and control he wanted when she was alive. After showing the envoy the artwork, the Duke casually turns his attention to his statue of Neptune and a seahorse. And the Duke is proud of his rare statue, right? Specifically describing Neptune as taming the seahorse immediately after discussing his disobedient wife and how he disciplined her by killing her. And the nameless duchess can be any independent Victorian woman in a relationship with a man who attempts to control and oppress her. Many women were in this position and the writing suggests that at the end of gender inequality was not near enough, right? The envoy literally attempts to step ahead of the Duke to warn the Count and his daughter, but the Duke stops him and says, nay, we'll go down together, sir, at the end of the poem, right? And this ominous line represents an unpromising future for women. The Duke is not stopped. Any effort from the envoy is dismissed and the maltreatment of women continues. So the message is clear. Whether God has not said a word about Porphyria's murder or the Duke holds back the envoy by saying, nay, we'll go together down, sir, right? Victorian women were oppressed and nobody, not even God, was able to stop the mistreatment anytime soon. So feminists and activists through the centuries have carried society far from the conditions of the Victorian era, yet the fight for absolute equality between the sexes continues. Modern feminism is a movement, ideology, and a field of study that centers less on women's autonomy and marriage equality, but continues to challenge a patriarchal society. Fem feminism today is more concerned with the wage gap between the sexes and reproductive rights, yet some men still feel discomfort towards women in power, as men did in the Victorian era. Right, so Browning's poems end by hopelessly considering the status and the future of women, but a reader of the, the Victorian era or of the modern day decide to embrace or reject this outlook.